All right, good day to you. God bless you. Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this Family Bible Study Hour. Say, we're going to go into a special subject today, and there you have it on your screen, discernment. It's very important that you be aware and have the, we'll even call it a gift of discernment. Discernment and judgment walk along hand in hand. That's not to say that you are to judge someone, but Let's say, let's take spirits as an example. You had better be able to judge whether a spirit is good or evil. That is to say, to discern whether the spirit is good or evil. They run hand in hand. Not, I'm not saying that you should judge man or anything of that nature, but discernment, absolutely necessary. God himself, if you do not study now this, this will, well first let's just talk about the makeup of man for a little bit. What do you discern with? Well naturally a man has a spirit, a body, and a soul of his own. And the soul of man that came from God, God creating the soul, dwells in whichever body that um, is natural in God's uh, direction of his children as a matter of fact, when you're in the flesh, you still, you have a flesh body, but you still have the same soul placed there by the living God. And then each soul has a spirit, and it probably would be better to think of it in the terms as your intellect, your thought process. And naturally, it is your spirit then that discerns other spirits, whether they are of God or whether they are of a negative force. Every individual has a spirit, and many people are gifted to the point that they can use their spirit, their intellect, to uh, reach out to others for good or bad, to teach uh, God's Word, your intellect, use, utilizing that to take forth that Word. And then when you hear a teacher, you'd better be able to discern whether or not he is teaching God's Word or something of his own or some traditions of men. Because if you do not, your father having written this letter to you, if you do not study his Word, God himself will, will send spirits to deceive you. I, I know that may shake some, but I'll prove it here in a moment because it's very biblical. God does not smile upon ignorance. He may wink at it at times if he himself put the spirit of stupor there or slumber as it's written in Romans chapter 11. But he does not take great pleasure in anyone that will not read a letter he has written to them. And quite frankly, I don't blame him. He is the creator that created all things and gave us the, the will and the way through his word, this set of instructions, that we can have peace of mind and be prosperous and have a good life even in the flesh upon this earth. And if someone doesn't adhere to that or read it, I don't blame him. I might do the same, I probably would do the same thing. I'm going to take, if we may, Chapter 2 of 2 Thessalonians, you've all been through it, but I'm going to use it as an example of how God himself will send strong delusion on those that won't study the written word and understand what the plan of God is where they can simply discern that that is negative. You'll remember 1 Thessalonians is the so-called rapture doctrine theory, though the word rapture is not in God's word. Paul hastily wrote this second letter of Thessalonians. You see, the subject of both letters of Thessalonians is the, uh, to the Thessalonians is the return of Christ. And they got it all messed up as to how he would return. So he hastily writes this second letter. Chapter 2, 2 Thessalonians, we ask a word of wisdom and discernment from our Father as we continue, begin this study. Let's go with it. Paul teaching. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming, this being the subject, the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto him. Now what did that say? I want to talk to you about the return of Jesus Christ to this earth 
and our gathering back to him. Now that's not difficult, is it? Any child can understand that. What he's about to say, this is how it's going to be. Verse 2, that you be not soon shaken in mind. Don't get all upset and don't let someone deceive your mind, your intellect, your spirit. Or be troubled neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter as from us. That first letter we wrote to you as that the day of Christ is at hand. In other words, don't let someone tell you the day of Christ is at hand unless the following events transpire because it's not, not going to be. Verse 3, let no man deceive you. How is your discernment, friend? Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not, repeat, shall not come, except first there become a there come a falling away first that's a polio which is to say apostasy not someone ripping off somewhere it's apostasy meaning to change from a, a, your true christianity to worshiping who and that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition now, this is real easy to understand a polio perdition to perish there's only one only one entity that God has already judged and sentenced to hell, bypassing the great white throne judgment, and that's Satan. So it shouldn't, you know, it doesn't take a, a, a wizard uh, uh, or um, to, uh, someone that is a great intellect to understand that. It's just ABC. Verse 4, what's he going to be doing? Who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped? Who? The son of perdition is going to do this so that he does what? So that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God and the world also. Some of you will be delivered up at that time. In other words, what did he say? Christ, the real Messiah, is not in any fashion returning to this earth don't let any man, any church, any tradition deceive you. It's not going to happen until after the son of perdition returns to this earth, Jerusalem, in Jerusalem, claiming to be Messiah, God, I mean the whole thing, the whole Godhead, if you would. Verse 5, remember you not that when I was with you, I told you these things. Question, we talked about it. We discussed it at length. Six, and now you know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. In other words, um, uh, verse seven, let's continue. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. The verb is transitive, meaning the same object and subject apply here to any, any scholar knows that. No big deal. It's talking about Satan sitting there, and he will sit there. Only who's holding him back? It's certainly not the church. The church can't, can hardly handle the manuscripts, much less uh, handle Satan. It's Michael, as it's written in Revelation chapter 12, verse 6 and 7. Verse 8, And then shall that wicked be revealed whom the Lord, who? The Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. That's the subject, the return of the Lord. He will destroy Satan who will be sitting in Jerusalem claiming to be Messiah. With the brightness of his coming, he will not appear in the clouds or anywhere else except through the Holy Spirit to anyone, anytime. And don't let any man rob you of your salvation. Now, if you would prefer to listen to traditions of men, and that being the subject, if you cannot discern from the simplicity that God has instructed, such as this Paul, to bring forth to you, then God doesn't have all that much interest in you even seeing the truth if you won't try. If you're not smart enough, well, smart enough to make a decision to study God's Word a little bit. A child can understand it. Many people think that I teach on a deeper level than many people are able to understand. And I have more children studying 
than I think most pastors do. Why? They find it interesting because it is not my word, but the word of God. It shows them their part within it as children of the living God. And they understand quite well. But anyone that could not understand that Paul has said within this, I want to talk to you about Jesus Christ returning to this earth and our gathering to him, that you don't let anybody deceive you, not even my first letter, because Satan first, the son of perdition, is going to sit in Jerusalem claiming to be God and claiming to be Jesus. And then... When the true Christ does return, he will destroy him with the brightness of his coming. Now, this is why Mark 13, the Sermon on the Mount, is written that you're going to be delivered up before him as a witness and a testimony that the gospel will go to the whole world. Now, discernment. Can you discern the truth? Can you discern the word of God? It's very serious. Verse 9. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders, that is to say, the role of instead of Jesus, or Antichrist as some would say, is Satan, none other than him, playing that role. Verse 10, and with all deceivableness, there's the word, discernment deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because, listen carefully, because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. In other words, they could not receive this word, the word of God, and discern truth. Then they were wide open to the deceivableness of this one claiming to be God and Christ. And if you don't study the word, that's where the truth is. The mouth of Jesus Christ with the sword of his mouth, that's the truth. His word, this word, this letter written to you. Do you know what God will do to you? 11, verse 11. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion, again deception, that they should believe a lie. Now wait just a minute. Who sent the delusion? God did. If they're so off the wall that they can't study God's word and have to trump up a little flyaway doctrine from a mentally ill woman in the year 1830, they deserve to be deceived and not saved though they claim to be. It's a very serious thing. God himself, for those that enjoy listening to the traditions of men without reading the simplicity of the letter that their own Father, Almighty God, has written them, God himself will sin. The delusion whereby you that do not practice discernment of the truth, you're going to believe a lie. You already do. Many do. Verse 12. That they all might be damned who believe not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Ah, oh, yes, I just want to... I don't want anything difficult. I just want to say, I believe and fly away into heavenly bygone days. It's not written. But they believe it. Why? Because God has sent the strong delusion and it's very important that you practice discernment, spiritual discernment. If it isn't written in God's word, it isn't true. That is to say, the prophecies of the end times. That's what we're talking about. 13. But we are bound to give thanks all the way to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the spirit and belief of the truth, proper discernment, receiving and knowing truth when you hear it, whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 15 to complete here. Therefore, brethren, stand fast. On what? God's Word. 
and hold the traditions which you have been taught, not man's traditions, but the traditions of Almighty God, whether by word or by epistle. Never let man's word override the gospel or an epistle. I'm speaking of the word of God or God himself will send you strong delusion, delusion and you'll believe the lie if you do not possess spiritual discernment. It's just the way it is. Well, how do I get spiritual discernment? By understanding the very simple plan of God, his plan of salvation as to how it will come to pass. As I'm stating, any child could understand this second chapter of Second Thessalonians. There's no great mystery to it unless God has already sent you strong delusion because you have never cared nor studied nor loved him. He's going to send you delusion. And buddy, there, and dear sister, there's a lot of it out there today. There's a lot of delusion that God sends and allows to hit the airways, the churches, and everywhere else. Jump on board, friend. You'd better be able to exercise discernment. It's extremely important. Now, let's go, let's go back to Acts chapter 16 real quickly. Let's, let's get a little practice from the New Testament. How do you work this discernment? How can you tell? Now, chapter 16, the book of Acts, verse 16, let's read it. <clears throat> Paul is going around the countries teaching God's word. And it came to pass, as he went to prayer, a certain damsel, a certain woman, possessed with a spirit of divination, met us, which brought her masters much gain by soothsaying, fortune-telling, witch-hunting, working miracles, seeing a little of the supernatural into wizardry. Why? She was possessed with a spirit of divination. Now, can you discern that? Do you understand what this word divination means? It comes from Puthan, which is, uh, the word python comes from it. A python that can hypnotize. And through um, hypnosis, take in victims. So does Satan work uh, the same way. The, in myth they're a, a creature of mythology even, but I guarantee you mythology is not the only place this spirit rests. It's a witch. And in a very bad sense, she had a spirit but well, how could you discern that? Well, listen to the next verse because it's going to add to it. Paul's praying. They're about to have a meeting. And what does this woman say? Verse 17. The same followed Paul and us and cried, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. It's absolutely a true statement. Why? The demon knew who they were. Even as the little demonic spirits or evil spirits, I should say spirits rather than demons. Some people call them demonic spirits. Well, in a sense they are, but the manuscripts simply call them evil spirits with the exception of this that's a little special. It's a, it's a uh, futon spirit. A, uh, so we see within that that she was possessed, but she is uh, calling out the truth. What does Paul do? Verse 18. And this did she many days. But Paul, being grieved, turned and said to the spirit, not the woman, to the spirit within the woman, I commend thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out at the same hour. Well, you know what happened. The, Paul was able to discern. And somewhat, well, if she was following him around and if she kept saying this, it was repetition. And she had quite a reputation. She made her masters, she was a slave girl. 
possessed. And she made her masters a great deal of money by being able to uh, speak of many things that uh, were akin to the supernatural as a seer. All right? Only a very wicked seer. Well, if you're out teaching God's Word, you don't want someone advertising for you that has that kind of reputation. It does not take an intelligent person to understand probably why she was allowed to follow them by her masters. As simony wanted to buy, purchase the Spirit of the Holy, the, the Holy Spirit, whereby he could do healing and things of that nature for a sideshow. These were, these masters of this poor possessed girl, child, were in it for the money. They made her, she made them great sums of money. And if they could understand and captivate the miracles that these that brought forth the gospel, by that I mean the healings and so forth, they would be all that much better off in their sideshow. Paul got tired of it. Why? He could discern the spirit. Discernment is an easy thing for a person that has been exposed to these sorts of things, demonic spirits, evil spirits, and so forth, and there's not a great deal to it, and there's not one of them behind every bush, but a negative spirit can work into your family just like that. When the whole family just can't seem to get along and everything is snappity snappity, you better take inventory, friend. I'm not saying there's an evil pot on dime, uh, uh, a, a divination within your family, but a little spirit of argument. And if you, if you order it out in the name of Jesus Christ uh, and have the family get their thinking caps back on in a positive sense, then you've practiced discernment and have brought peace instead of turmoil. It's that simple. Now, let's, as an example of discernment, Paul having exercised it here and showing you how very cautious you must be. Because, as we noted back in Thessalonians, great miracles were performed by this evil one when he will arrive. He's allowed that. And, a, de a demonic entity is supernatural. Therefore, they know many things that human beings don't, and this makes them attractive to those that like to play games with the unknown. But let's go back to probably one of the smartest men that there ever was. Let's say it's First Kings, I believe. I want to go to First Kings. And we're going to go to chapter 3. How does a man attain discernment? How does a woman, how does a child actually receive a gift of discernment? So we're going to go to Solomon, one of the wisest men that ever was. Let's go to chapter 3 of First Kings. Let's pick it up with verse 7 of 1 Kings, and verse 7 reads, Solomon speaking. He, he here now that he has taken over in the place of his father David, and there are millions of people that he must lead. So what does he do? Verse 7, he prays to the Father, and he says, And now, O Lord my God, Thou hast made thy servant king instead of David my father. <clears throat> and I am but a little child. I'm a very young man. I know not how to go out or come in. I want to do what's right, and I really don't know which way to turn, Father. Now, the reason I'm using this, many of you don't. Many of us don't. Let's be more complete. Without approaching our Father, that's how you find out what it is that, that we are supposed to do and to please him, and what do we pray for? First, eight, and thy servant is in the midst of thy people which thou hast chosen, a great people that cannot be numbered nor counted for multitude. Here I am in, res in responsible father. 
9. Give therefore thy servant an understanding heart. That means mind, intellect, or spirit. To judge thy people. That's to say to discern. Judgment and discernment going hand in hand. That I may discern between good and bad. For who is able to judge this, thy so great a people? In other words, Solomon, the very first thing he did, he prayed for understanding. That's wisdom. And the discernment to be able to judge between good and bad, between good and evil. Verse 10, And the speech pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this thing. Our Father is not hard to please, beloved. When you go to him and you talk to him as Solomon did here, uh, there was no sin in not knowing for sure what to do. But when you lay it on your Father's heart, it pleases him. You understand? Verse 11, And God said unto him, Because thou hast asked this thing, and has not asked for thyself long life. A lot of people would do that. Neither hast asked riches for thyself. A lot of people would do that. Nor has asked the life of thine enemies. Ask for the life of thy. Ask me to kill your enemies for you. You haven't asked for any of those things. But has asked for thyself understanding to discern judgment. Beloved, it's very important and it's precious to your heavenly Father for you to seek and pray for that discernment, to know truth from fiction, to know good from evil, and to be able to judge, not necessarily people as Solomon would have to do here, but in many cases in life you have to judge a situation. And that's why I use the statement, judgment and discernment walk hand in hand. Verse 12, Behold, I have done according to thy words, lo, I have given thee a wise and an understanding heart, that's to say mine, so that there was none like thee before thee, neither after thee shall any arise like unto thee. And so it was, Solomon went down as the wisest other than God through the Son himself. It would be immediately following this that such wisdom would be utilized that two women at a hard time would claim one baby as their own. And, I mean, it was... It was. It had come to the point that it would had raised become such an issue that it was brought before the king, and he had to make the decision as to which woman was the actual mother, the natural mother of this child. Do you know how he did it? He said, "Okay, you both claim him. Cut the little baby in half." And give one half to one mother and the other half to another mother. And one mother didn't say anything. And the other mother says, oh, no, no. Let the other have the little one. And Solomon said, that is the mother of the child. Give the child to the woman that loved the babe enough to spare his life. That's the real mother. That's motherhood. That type of wisdom. Simplicity? Yes. Because it's natural. And our Father is supernatural and to be, which means more natural, using common sense. Great wisdom is not fancy rhetoric. But wisdom in truth and that in that that is natural. Many people overlook wisdom trying to impress their peers rather than look at and understand and pray for wisdom in the simplicity in which our Father teaches His own. 
how long will you have to practice discernment? Well, if we may, as we head back for the New Testament, let's stop off at the book of Ezekiel chapter 44, which if you've studied with me for very long, you know it pertains to the millennium. It pertains to God's elect during the millennium, what they will be doing as God's word is being taught in that thousand year period to many of those that even God himself had spent, sent the spirit of confusion upon. Hey, if you want it, he'll give it to you, friend. If you want to go around hunting spiritual things to follow or to to uh, tickle your imagination, God will send it to you. If you put all that above the spirit he has sent, which is to say the Holy Spirit, he'll accommodate you. How long will he do that? All the way through. We're going now to the millennium whereby you will know what he expects. Verse 23, and it reads, concerning God's elect called the Zadok, a Hebrew word that simply means the just, that is the elect, all right? And they shall teach my people, this is during the millennium, the difference between the holy and the profane and cause them to discern. There it is again, discernment. Cause them to discern between the unclean and the clean. It's going to continue into the millennium, verse 24. And in controversy, they shall stand in judgment, with judgment and discernment running hand in hand, and they shall judge it according to my judgments, not the traditions of men, but God's judgments. And they shall keep my laws and my statutes in all mine assemblies, and they shall hallow my Sabbaths. Um, and there you have it. Discernment will be with us throughout all that time. Can you discern spirits? Do you know, can you tell when an evil spirit approaches you? Again, there's not one behind every bush, but my dear friend, if you think that Satan's own little uh, messengers, that is to say in spirit form, not, not uh, de facto, de facto spiritually, yes, but not in body is what I'm saying, are not on this earth, you're mistaken, all right? They're here. But do you have to fear them? Of course not. Because if you have discernment, you simply order them in the power of the name away. And they're gone because they're afraid of you then. You become a champion of the Heavenly Father. So spiritual discernment is very important. And again, God will send a spirit of confusion if you don't seek it, if you don't care. Learn from the Word of God, and what would we learn from today's discussion? That who would you want to be like? The masters of the little slave girl? Or would you want to be like Solomon? I would think so, because he was indeed blessed then follow Solomon's example. And the next time you pray for, to your father, talk to him, ask him for wisdom, ask him for discernment, that you may be a better servant of the living God, whereby you can help your brothers and sisters. Don't just ask something for yourself. God doesn't like that. It pleased God that Solomon only asked for others. And yet, did, um, was, did he turn out to be a poor boy? I think not. Solomon would have been one of the richest men that have ever been because God poured blessings out on him too. Do you think he would not do that for you today? Of course he will. If you have the patience, the wisdom, and the understanding and practice discernment. It's important. Pay attention to what you hear. Do not accept every spirit that floats through. 
If you want to chase a funny one, God will give it to you. Boy, will he give it to you. God simply wants his children to think for themselves. And it is his will that hopefully that your will will be to love him and want to please him. Because that's what God's plan ultimately is, is to have his children wise enough that they can discern his love for them and in return their love back to our Father. It makes his day. So discernment. If you want to be, if you want to be deceived, just listen to men without checking them out in the Word of God and you'll get there soon enough. God will even help you as we have discovered in this lecture. I could take you and probably will to another place or two. In the next lecture, we'll complete this subject, discernment. All right, bless your heart. You listen a moment, won't you please?